Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I'm so grateful to Jim, Haley, um, and all of you for uh, welcoming me to this part of the country. I've never been here before. Uh, <clears throat> I just flew in from Sydney yesterday. I didn't sleep at all last night, so if I suddenly lie down on the floor, uh, just wake me up. Um, <clears throat> I want to start with an emotional low point with all of you, and then by the end of it, we're going to be at the high point. So we'll just start at the bottom here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sustainability, if this isn't working now. While we figure that out, I'm going to, uh, yeah. I get asked a lot, um, what's my definition of sustainability? Thought it would be good to kick off with that. And I just rip off other people's definition of sustainability. And this is my favourite one at the moment, is uh, coming out of the Stockholm Research Institute. And they talk about um, planetary boundaries. Boundaries within which humans can engage with and utilise the planet's resources without undercutting its innate capacity to renew itself. So once we start undercutting that capacity for organic renewal, whether it's fisheries, biodiversity, climate, then we're in trouble. And the other thing that this uh, research institute points out is that once we start undercutting those planetary life support systems and eating in to that, that core resilience, we also risk catastrophic non-linear changes get launched. And that's the threshold that we find ourselves at this point in time. So our pressures on these Earth systems have reached this scale where we really are facing the prospect of abrupt non-linear changes that are well and truly going to be out of our control. Uh, <clears throat> they're proposing an approach in which we define these planetary boundaries and that we collectively embrace an agreement to stay within these planetary boundaries because of this understanding that if we don't, we do risk these catastrophic changes. So I'm going to play this very short video of one of the founders of, of this family. Is this band equivalent then of human development within the safe operating space of the planetary balance? What you see here in black line is the safe operating space, the quantified boundaries as suggested by this analysis. The yellow dot in the middle here is our starting point, the pre-industrial point where we're very safely in the safe operating space. In the 50s, we start branching out. In the 60s already, through the Green Revolution, the Haber-Bosch process of fixing nitrogen for the atmosphere. You know, humans today take out more nitrogen for the atmosphere than the whole biosphere does naturally as a whole. We don't transgress the climate bound until the early 90s, actually right after Rio. And today we are in a situation where we estimate that we've transgressed three boundaries. The rate of biodiversity loss, which is the sixth extinction period in the history of humanity, one of them being the extinctions of the dinosaurs. Nitrogen and climate change. But we still have some degrees of freedom on the others, but we're approaching fast on land, water, phosphorus, and oceans. But this gives a new paradigm to guide humanity, to put on the light on our so far overpowered industrial vehicle, which operates as if we're only on a dark, straight highway. And I'll use one more short video clip, the next video clip, if you can play that. This is also very short, but I, I really think these framings of sustainability are very useful to kick off our day together. <coughs> the term Anthropocene or Anthropocene has been proposed to describe the current geologic epoch defined by our current planetary transformation that will be detectable millions of years from now because of the carbon deposits, because of the nuclear isotopes and, and ecosystems all over the planet. We are actually a geologic force on this planet. And the ability to modify ecosystems at a planetary scale evidences the profound conundrum underlying how we direct the power of the human imagination and human ingenuity. And this is the question, how do we direct the power of human imagination and human ingenuity? 
business for good is a, a very important framing of that. How do we direct the ingenuity of business to these ends? So another framing here of our situation is that humankind over recent millennia have been walking the path of a broken relationship with these planetary life support systems. And that our journey forward is to redefine this relationship with these complex living systems. What we need to change to, to redefine that relationship, to bring it to a point where it is a sustainable relationship, is a multi-sectoral response. It can't just be a response in the business sector because there won't be consumers for the products. It can't be only a response in the education sector or there won't be jobs for the graduates with the, the new skills we're developing. It can't be simply a response from the political sector, the government, because there'll be instability in, in change, radic, rapid changeover in government, lack of support for the regulation. So we have this complex dilemma. It's an interdependent web of organizations across society that have to move lockstep forward to really grapple with this. So this is the, you know, we're getting to the low point of my presentation here. And what appears to be happening is that we're collectively stuck, at best, at doing less bad. If you really look at our collective efforts today, we're really seeing at best stuck at doing less bad. The majority of us is still speeding up towards the abyss. Now, when we've been engaging uh, for the last decade or so in the sustainability space, particularly in higher ed, but also <coughs> in business, and we've been asking ourselves, why are we stuck at slowing down? The common response from people in the sustainability profession in leadership positions has been, it's just disengagement, you know, we're just having trouble getting people engaged around this issue. Well, it turns out that disengagement is a symptom. It's not actually the root problem. It's a symptom of an organisational model, because disengagement is endemic to organisations around the world. 70% of the workforce sleep walking effectively at work. This is, this is a huge indicator of something very fundamental. The second thing that people will often say, which has been hindering our ability to go beyond doing less bad to actually doing good, is this real struggle you have internally to get resources for innovation, resources for change. If you're inside a business, inside a university, inside a government agency, and you have a good idea, how hard is it to get that little bit of seed capital to develop that idea, do the research, to really pilot it through? Very, very difficult. We've interpreted that in the sustainability space as being specific to sustainability, but it's not. It's actually intrinsic to the organizational model in which we find ourselves. Low levels of decision-making agility permeate our organizations, whether you're corporations, uh, small to medium-sized enterprise, higher ed, hospitals, you name it. The difficulty your average sustainability uh, change leader has is they'll come up with a good idea, they'll get support for it, they'll even prove that it's a feasible idea financially, operationally, and then they'll try to get it approved and scaled up, and then they get stuck again because nobody knows who should be making that decision. So the decision either gets sidelined or it goes into a very poorly designed process and it doesn't get executed effectively, or, and this is what spawned the entire sustainability profession, this is probably many of you in the room, you end up having to get the approval of everybody before anything can happen. <clears throat> low levels of change leadership. Uh, again, uh, very low levels of, of fundamental capacity for leading change. What we've discovered is that, and this is one of the most um, enjoyable paradoxes, is that you are able to bring about more change if you're able to bring about enough stability. So it's the work of creating stability and removing risk and removing un uncertainty that actually opens the way for change to happen. So a great change leader or a, a, a great leader of an organisation is very adept at addressing risk and removing uncertainty and uh, uh, removing instability for people. 
So all of this swirls around us and makes change very difficult in our organisations. And I use this metaphor or analogy of changing a light bulb at Harvard. When I first started there, we were looking for easy wins and we went after the, you know, the low hanging fruit, the easy paybacks, three years, found these simple lighting projects. This was in a student residence went to who we thought the decision maker was, the facility director for that building. First question was, why haven't they been changed already? It's a very simple switch out from T12 to T8. Now it would be, who knows, T minus <laughs> one. Uh, facility director explained, you know what, that's been bugging me for a long time, but I just, I just don't have the money in my deferred maintenance budget to fix things that aren't broken. Uh, so this is Harvard, but this is all around the world. This is so we created a revolving loan fund that had capital sitting outside of the very constrained finance and accounting behaviours of the institution. And we said, well, we'll pay for it, but you pay us back with the savings. So the director liked that. No interest charge or anything. Then he confessed, well, I'd love to do it, but I don't have the staff capacity to manage it. Again, my staff has been whittled down. We only have enough staff to fix broken things. Oh, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll manage the project. Oh, I just realized if I have to pay it back, I've got to get my finance manager to approve this. And my finance manager only says yes to me once, maybe twice a year, I'm noticing. <laughs> I don't want to use my yes on this. I've got a big yes that I need later. So can you use your political capital? Yeah, OK, we'll use our political capital. We manage to get the finance manager to approve it. So at this point, we're thinking, all right, we've given you the idea. We've given you the money. We're actually going to do it for you, and we got your boss's approval. You think that would be it, but then the building manager got engaged and needed soothing. The housemaster of this particular residential dorm, dorm got word of a new lighting project, and apparently had just done an exhaustive um, redesign and was worried about the light reflecting differently on the paint colours. And in order for us to soothe the housemaster, we had to pull a little move to get the students involved to advocate to the housemaster. Then the maintenance crew got all up in arms because they were worried about how do you dispose of these new light bulbs and they threw a, a whole wrench in the works. And meanwhile, the um, vendor who was sick of waiting for this job to finally, you know, they dropped off the face of the earth and we had to get a new one. And so on and so forth. Three months of constant facilitation to answer the question, of how many people at Harvard does it take to change a life? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the metaphor of our ages. I mean, who relates to this? Okay, so business for good. What chance does it have when you know the the, the business that was trying to sell the light bulbs, the business that was going to you know the vendor dealing with these incredibly um, incredibly restrained consumer responses, which are a product of this. So it's a hardwired separation that exists in the organisation. So you you find yourself always having to build the connective tissue back into an organisation that somehow has separated itself out so acutely over time. So we surveyed 180, we found 180 sustainability change leaders, people that had done something pretty significant successfully. We picked faculty in higher ed who had actually managed to change the curriculum to include sustainability because we thought, wow, if they did that, they've, you know, they're really showing some skills here. And we surveyed them, asked them, what's an analogy that it describes what it's like to be you? as a change leader in your organisation, and these were the most common analogies. Cat herder, tightrope walker, swimming upstream, local leaders being tonto with a lone ranger at a bank robbers convention, <laughs> trying to interest people in junk food who, who, who uh, trying to interest people who love junk food in a healthy diet. Learning Spanish, finding myself in China, <laughs> being a competitor on American Idol, where it all comes down to that one great presentation, and if you stuff it up, it's all done. Being Stephen Bradbury, who won gold because everybody else fell over. Being <laughs> jelly to the wall. Anyway, you get the gist, the emotive quality here to be a change leader in our organisations today. This isn't just higher ed. We get these analogies right across the board. This is the universal human experience 
of what it's like to try to lead change. So this is, this is what we're doing here at the moment. We're exhausting ourselves with this effort. So, around us is swirling the 21st century, replete with so many new demands for innovation. Today, our organisations have to be as good at innovation as they've learnt to be at efficiency and control. And this is the new pressure on our organisations. We need this for sustainability, but we need this for all manner of adaptive, complex 21st century dilemmas that we're facing. Or we could just do this, which many of us are still doing. But some of us have started to think, well, we've actually got to transform the fundamental organisational model that we're working <coughs> in so that change itself actually becomes easier. And that as you go through processes of change and innovation, you develop a greater fitness for it. So that rather than coming out of the end of a process of innovation and change exhausted, you come out of it with a higher level of fitness and ability to take on even more change, more innovation. What if that's possible? Well, we started looking around at the state of play and the first thing that's become very, very clear is that management-driven hierarchy or command control as an operating system on its own is fundamentally inadequate for leading the amount of change, engagement, innovation that we need in the 21st century. This, however, remains the predominant organisational model across all sectors. So if we are going to really scale up business for good, we're clearly going to have to think differently about the predominant organisational model that is underpinning the way in which we work. So we know command control as an operating system has got incredible abilities, and this is why it has been so radically successful through recent centuries. It's very good at directing, specialising, scaling, efficiency, consistency, accountability, uh, concentration of power. It's very, very poor at change, at agility, at shared purpose, at learning, empowerment, innovation. All the things that have become front and centre for the 21st century. All the things that are going to underpin getting to the point where business is for good. So we now understand that business for good, it's a qualitatively different leadership challenge to move from doing less bad. You can stay in doing less bad in a command control operating system, but if you really want to move to high volumes of innovation and change, to really core integration of sustainability, you're going to have to really position sustainability now to become a driver of deep organisational transformation. So it's not just, well, we're going to use it to purchase different products and use different energy. We're actually going to position it to change the way in which we make decisions, the way in which we engage each other, the way in which we utilise our creative group intelligence is going to have to change. Now, there's a new and growing chorus around this big theme out there, but the most important source of understanding here is, is your own intuition. Because I guarantee you what I'm about to say, many of you in the room already know it, you have already experienced it, and what we are about to have is a shared language about our own intuitive understanding. Where we are moving is from a command control operating system to a dual operating system that's really animated around shared purpose. <clears throat> What this is about is creating a new kind of versatility in our organisation so that when you've got something that requires a routine, that requires a focus on efficiency and control and accountability, you deploy your command control operating system. But when you've got something that requires learning and engagement and innovation, you deploy your adaptive operating system. Now, giving the adaptive operating system a name as grand as the adaptive operating system, is bringing out of the closet something that many of us already deploy intuitively in our organisations to get anything done, anything new done in particular. These operating systems have very clear traits. 
The adaptive operating system is really empowered and mobilized by intrinsic purpose. The command control operating system can get away with, you don't care about what you're doing, doesn't matter, we're paying you to do it, you're going to do it. The adaptive operating system lives or dies by its ability to engage a sense of purpose in participants and to foster positive social dynamics so that the relationship context that people exist in really incites and energises their desire to be in a social learning process with each other. Because we love that. That is a very human trait, to be in a shared learning process with fellow travellers without them all being your boss or your subordinate. They're in it because they believe in it with you. The adaptive operating system is really about co-creating the process of learning and change. It's very much supported by social dynamics, story, um, and it's incredibly dynamic. It turns up when it needs to, and then it goes away when it's finished. It turns up again when it needs to, goes away when it's finished. Command control operating system is hardwired, rigid, routine, and fixed. They're extraordinarily complementary, and if led well, they bring the best out in each other. When not understood, this one will always win out over that one. So the adaptive operating system requires more shared understanding. And this is where I, oh, I want to say again, a lot of this you already intuitively get. It's about just giving a richer shared uh, lexicon to this experience. What it does brilliantly is it senses what's going on. It senses opportunities. It's the thing that empowers the workforce in any business, any organisation, to have permission to go out and come up with a new idea or to perceive something that could be done better or to attune to some new risk that the organisation hasn't seen coming from the top. It connects, it generates engagement, fosters group intelligence, it, it innovates, it learns. It's got its own logic and it's driven by something quite different to the command control operating system. The command control is driven by authority, structure, roles, responsibility and really clear rules of the game. The adaptive operating system is again driven by that intrinsic sense of purpose where somebody's internal values are now aligning with uh, the action that the organisation or, or their group within the organisation wants to take. It offers a, a person an opportunity to be whole in the process. Uh, it fosters psychological safety so that all people can feel safe to have a voice and be engaged in a shared learning process. It's highly creative. It, it learns socially so that you get your early adopters out in front, they have a victory, they become the champions, and that stimulates others to follow very quickly. Business for good requires the proliferation of a more adaptive organisational model. Something akin to this dual operating system that really is driven and animated around shared purpose. So a leader then is now necessarily preoccupied with a balance of both the traditional goals and structure and roles and skills, but now balanced with an equal preoccupation of purpose and process and conditions. Conditions like emotional intelligence, conditions like psychological safety, uh, processes like seed capital for piloting projects, processes that um, allow for champions and early adopters to have platforms for their stories to really stimulate engagement from others. There are all sorts of processes and conditions that we're learning are highly, highly effective in bringing to life an adaptive operating system. What's very um, beautiful to me and powerful is that this models very powerfully on how our planetary life support systems adapt and remain resilient amongst the, 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 the enormous amount of change that goes on in any living system. And this is the model, panarchy model which occurs in nature in, in, at the small scale and large scale of a constant cycling from exploitation of new opportunities, reorganising to, to make the most of new opportunities, then hardwiring habits and patterns and structures around those new opportunities 
and then again sensing into new possibilities, exploiting those, reorganizing around those, hardwiring. So you just <coughs> look at a tree and you see this. So a tree, the leaves, the roots are your adaptive operating system, always sensing into new opportunities, accessing that new light, accessing the, the, the nutrients. But the trunk of the tree is your command control operating system. It's rigid, it pr provides this routine flow of nutrients. It doesn't change a whole lot too fast. And it's not designed to. Together, they create this resilience. You see this pattern a lot in nature. I, I really think there'll be a time in the not too distant future where we'll look back and think, how in the world did we ever think we could get by with just this? How did we think that in such a complex, changing universe? So, I want to stop there for a few questions, just to get a sense of where you're at, and then I'll, I'll continue uh, once again, a little tuned into to what you're thinking and how you're reacting to this. Any reactions, questions? So, just to make sure I'm clear, are you saying within a single organization you have both? I am, yes. <coughs> yes. Are there examples of that today? All over the place. In your okay. own organization, I can guarantee you that you would have traits of the adaptive operating system turning up at certain times. It's gone unnamed. Okay. And it often gets, um, <laughs> it often just gets labeled, you know, that's just an enthusiastic person over there, isn't it? Look <laughs> uh, at them go. But actually, they're responding to some conditions around them that have perhaps given them permission to to bring a, a, a type of um, purpose and creative capacity to the organization. They weren't doing it because they were told to do it. Uh, there's no, like, they're not going to get promoted for doing it. They're doing it because there's some purpose in it for them. So yeah, it's it's all about creating the potential for, for both in your organization. Now, in any one organization, we're talking about people occupying either one. So that it's not like half the population is only in adaptive and half in command. No, you're in a dance. You, you want people to be literate in both and to move between them according to the moment and according to, to where they are in the process of idea creation and, and change. Now, maybe following up on this question, uh, there's been a lot of talk, I guess, over the last few years about the permeability of organizational boundaries and how organizations, even in the command and control structure, are more effective if they bring in stakeholders like customers into the decision-making process. Uh, does not kind of defining this as a, a, an organization-specific thing within those boundaries hinder its ability somehow? No, that's, that's a great question too. So once an organization starts to really embrace the adaptive operating system, they become more able to bring in more complex stakeholder uh, involvement. And they become more capable of actually metabolizing that usefully. Instead of, oh, let's just have a big community town hall and get all these great ideas and then nothing happens. Which happens all the time. Uh, there's, there's the impulse to want to seek stakeholder involvement a lot. But there's not the internal maturity then to know well, what the hell do we do with all this creativity? Like it becomes kind of disruptive to the command control. So it's the integration, it's learning how you integrate and transition between the two that is the real game changer for an organization. How do you take what the adaptive operating system is generating and stimulating and how do you know when to transition it to the command control operating system to scale it out and resource it. And that's, that's, the, that's where we're at. I mean, that's what's so damn exciting right now is that we, right here in the room, this is all very, very new, but I can guarantee that a lot of you have some awesome stories and ideas and examples of how we could collectively be doing this better. Can you give a, an example of how you've seen this happen in your classroom? I can. Yes. So, funny you should ask me. <laughs> so, the thing about the adaptive operating system is it gets a certain kind of work done that the command control operating system is poorly designed to do. Um, it, it can stimulate intrinsic purpose, 
it can generate agency in people, and it can create processes that allow for idea flow to move much more smoothly through your organization. It's superior at sensing, and that's the big thing that it does for you. It also can handle much higher levels of ambiguity. What freaks the command control operating system out is uncertainty. And it creates all sorts of damage inside the command control because it's constantly trying to lunge at new stuff. And then there's a whole blame game that trickles through the organization. Oh, who stuffed that up? And then you get like these vicious cycles of people becoming disengaged and whatnot. But the adaptive operating system, on the other hand, can handle very high levels of ambiguity, extremely high levels, and can work through those to the point where there's more and more certainty. And when that certainty gets to a certain threshold, then the command control operating system can digest that. I'm about to get to the hard example. It's also highly adaptive in that it can pivot much more easily. Once you've invested in your command control operating system, you've got a new policy, you've set new targets, you've created new performance requirements, it's much more un unwieldy to like suddenly like change direction if you've discovered that they weren't functioning. Uh, but here's what I think one of the most important things that the adaptive operating system does. It allows within your organization for your early adopters and your innovators to be unleashed and put to use in the highly ambiguous work of new discovery outside of the command control operating system, getting them to work through to the point where there's a threshold of certainty where they can then support the early majority, late majority by engaging the command control operating system to bring that structure. And this is where the Harvard example uh, is going to come into play here. So we have at Harvard more green buildings than any of us in the world now. Now, this was a exhausting, mysterious journey that I was in the, I'd say, fair and square in the bowels of for about eight years. So it was the result of a balance of bottom-up, because that's really what the adaptive operating system allows, bottom-up or sideways leadership much more effectively, balanced with horizontal and top-down. There's an enormous amount of applied learning that had to be engaged through uh, piloting, and there were very touch-and-go moments of trying to integrate between the adaptive and the command control. So, not only do we have an extraordinary number of LEED certified, so there are over 100 LEED certified now, but our certified projects are largely in the goal to platinum end. So what that speaks to, um, and, and actually we've achieved platinum projects at no added cost. So what it speaks to is a very, very deep learning process that's happened internally, which is again what the adaptive operating system is very good at. So this project here, LEED Platinum Historic Renovation, no added cost. Only, you can only achieve that when you have a profound level of engagement and organizational learning that's been going on for a long time. So our story with this was, when I got to Harvard, there was no green building going on. US Green Building Council's LEED was competing in the market against several others, and it had not risen to supremacy. But we chose that, um, and I went quickly shopping around. Well, the first thing I did was I got all excited about this green building standard, and I went to what I thought was the right committee to make a decision to approve this so the whole university should adopt it. And I quickly uh, um, almost got fired for doing that. <laughs> and that so that was in you know, 2000, 2001. I don't know, it was fresh off the boat. Uh, from Sydney, it was cold, I didn't know really much about Harvard and that was a real shock to me. So then I retreated and decided, you know, I just got to find some friendly people. Uh, so I went shopping all around the university, probably talked to 30 or 40 project managers of green buildings at Harvard and sitting down with them, is this new green building standard? I 
think we should really do it here. Do you have any interest? No, 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 no. And then I got my first innovator, early adopter. Just, just their mindset, their personality was like, oh, well, that's kind of cool. I wouldn't mind having a crack at that. But here's the deal. If it goes right, I get the credit. If it goes wrong, you get the blame. <laughs> deal. Okay, so three of them stepped up under those terms and we started piloting this green building standard. Now, it was really laborious. These projects go on for years, you know, they're years. 10, 20, 100 million dollar projects. So I eventually get a fourth player and then I get a fifth player and then something happens around here. So but once we got five early adopters who were piloting this lead standard, I started to create forums for their stories to be shared with their peers. So it wasn't me sitting down saying, oh, you did this thing. It was your peer saying, I did this thing. And you know what? I got credit for it. And you know, it was great. You should do it. And so we created those forums. If we didn't deliberately design them, they wouldn't have happened because they're all busy. They just run from project to project, and those stories don't get airplay. So we had to deliberately design those forums for peer-to-peer -peer contagion to happen. So that starts happening, and we get more and more of these projects. Now, through this process, we're having to answer a whole lot of questions about how do you do it, how much does it cost, how can we streamline the process, how do we actually provide the skills that we need to do it well. We had to build those skills inside the institution. We were suffering with things like architects coming up and saying, well, you know, the lead thing, that's going to be a $100,000 premium if you want to certify. We won't charge it $100,000 if you don't want to certify. And initially we were like, oh, gosh, I don't want to do that. But then we started learning it. We were like, that's bull. Like that, it should be more than five grand to certify it. And we started to learn how to, how to really argue them down. And we found that there, there was innocence in what they were doing. They just, again, were covering themselves from risk by overestimating. So this is the adaptive operating system at work. I created psychological safety. They piloted. Then we used the social dynamics of the peer-to-peer -peer influence to get more of them on board. And then we use that whole process to build all of this capacity within the institution. At the right point in time, we knew enough about it to start the work of getting the command control operating system back in the room to talk about, can we hardwire this? Can we adopt it across the institution? Now, this is where there was a real iteration. And this is what this, this symbol is about, iteration. You've got it, there are certain points in the journey where it's not just this and it's not just that, but it's the two of them having a very, very complex conversation with each other about, well, the command control kept coming back to us saying, well, you've proven that it's cost effective, but we don't like the way you've proven it. So you've got to prove it in a different way. So then we go back and prove it in a different way. Well, yeah, that's okay, but we, we want you to prove it in a different way again. So we, but we had to do that you know, just iterating until everyone in the command control operating side of the house felt like, you know what, there is no risk here for us. So then it was a matter of, okay, well, who, who makes this decision? Ah, oh, well, you know, maybe, um, maybe start with uh, the vice president for government community affairs. Mm. Well, I think it's a good idea, but I can't make that decision. Why don't you try vice president administration? Oh, that's an excellent idea. You've really covered your bases there, but I can't make that decision. Well, maybe you should try the deans. All the deans. Okay. All the deans. Oh, yep, we actually think this is pretty good, but you should talk to the finance deans first. All the finance deans. Oh, we think it's pretty good, yeah, but if you talk to the provost. Oh, the provost. Yes, the provost is on board. Have you talked to the president? Finally, the president's on board. So it's this. But if, if the institution had had a decision-making process ready to make that kind of decision, we could have cut three years off. So that's this lack of decision-making agility. But we got through it in the end. Then, this is the power of the command control operating system. Here we are, 23 projects. Within six months, it had more than doubled because the middle majority now were fully on board because the command control operating system had said this is now a requirement 
and it's <coughs> part of your capital budget approval process that you have to meet it. Boom, everyone's through. It's a long story of it, a very rich case study of how this works. There are smaller examples though. There are, there are moments that happen in the space of minutes or an hour, more like, uh, where the need to foster a different kind of group intelligence is very important in meetings. So I highly recommend this book, Social Physics. These two, uh, uh, these, these are some of my favorite points out of it. Exposure to the surrounding peer behaviors is the largest single factor in driving idea flow, which is what we did at Harvard. Like we had to get those peer behaviors and have them out in front of everybody to create that, that idea flow. For group intelligence, the pattern of interaction amongst the group is more important than all the other factors taken together combined. It's more important than the education level, more important than the intelligence of the individuals, more important than anything, uh, which is a profound finding. So what it's saying is the way in which we run our meetings, to pay attention to the pattern of interaction so that one person isn't dominating or being too passive. Example, very quick one. Minnesota airport snow removal blokes. We call them blokes in Australia. We call them guys. So they're mostly ex-military, highly unionized, very command control. So with climate change and everything, there's kind of weird snow patterns happening and you would have noticed if you travel much. Uh, getting snow off that runway is crucial for these airports and they're struggling to figure this out at the moment. So Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, they tried, 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 nothing happened. Then one day the manager goes, you know what, I'm going to try this thing. I want you guys, and I don't know, it's eight to twelve of them. I, wanna, I want you guys next time it snows, I'm going to leave the room, see this whiteboard. I want you to come up with ideas, all of you, come up with your ideas. I want you to get out on your snow plows and try every idea you come up with. And I want you to keep doing that until you come up with something good. No idea is a bad idea. Don't fight amongst yourselves. Just put all your ideas up and work through them. And then come and tell me what you came up with. And all I tell you is I remain in control of the final veto rights. Because if you give me something that I can't sell up, then I can't move it. For you. So this sounds really simple, but this had never happened before with these guys where they'd been given that kind of permission. <coughs> now the funny thing was that the manager, um, I think it was power, the manager um, lets his own superior know that he's doing this thing next time it snows, the guys are going to get out and do this thing. And the superior goes, oh no, I've got to be in the room for that because I don't want them coming up with these crazy ideas and They'll get all attached to them and then we'll be the bad guys when we say no. And the manager is not, no, no, no. If you or I go in that room, they'll clam up, we won't get anything out of them. Because that's what they do. And so he held him off. So this is literally a very small example of keeping the command control operating system out of the room, giving permission for the adaptive operating system. Everybody equal, social learning, piloting. So sure enough, the happy ending, you, you, you can see it coming is they came up with these brilliant ideas that cut their snow removal time down by something like 30%. And it was so good that several other airports have now come over to get trained. And what's more, they enjoyed it so much that they reenacted <coughs> that process on several other problems now. It's just a, a little change like that. So learning by doing is a key property of the adaptive operating system. To foster that, you have to be willing to give permission for that kind of process and certainly provide some seed capital to it. It's highly attuned to how people feel, and this is the psychological safety issue. When, um, in order to really enliven that group intelligence, people do have to feel that they can have their feelings addressed along the way. So this is another quick Harvard story to that point. Harvard's buildings, only 19% of the, the square footage is labs, but it was accounting for 50% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And a lot of that came down to air change rates in these buildings. 
we're trying to keep people safe by moving the air through so they don't get exposed to whatever's in these labs. So over the years, we'd just um, reflexively ended up with air change rates in the vicinity of eight, ten, eight times an hour, 10 air changes an hour, 12 air changes an hour, sometimes 16 air changes an hour. And we started exploring, well, do we really need that in every lab? And we found a friendly lab, the, Ar the Arboretum lab, um, the tree people. And they were interested in this conversation. No one else was interested in that conversation. They were like, no, oh, we don't want to risk like someone getting cancer 15 years down the track and suing us. We're keeping our air change rates, just as they are. But the tree guys were like, no, nope, we'd like to have this conversation. So we convened everybody that we thought had a, had a stake in that decision. The environmental health and safety people, the engineers, the building occupants, the building owners, blah, 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 and us. We got in the room and it was awful. It was like, it was, just took me right back to my, my childhood when my two brothers were teenagers and we were just going at it. And it was so hostile and everybody was positioning for authority. That, that's what walked into the room was a command control operator. So everyone was positioning for authority. It was such an unusual question that they'd been asked. Can we do something different? To F, their instinct was, I've got to prove my authority. I've got to prove that my position is the right position. And the meetings were terrible for the first two meetings. But we just kept listening. All right, let's just get it all out on the table. Vent, vent as you will. And eventually, we shifted to an adaptive operating system where it became a sense of shared purpose of like, once everybody realized that nobody's going to make a decision against your interests, we're here to figure out, is there a sweet spot within all of our interests that might be different to what we're just doing? And sure enough, once we got to our adaptive dynamic where it, there was more group intelligence, less positioning and, and bickering, we came to switch from six <coughs> down to, to, from 10 down to six uh, an hour. And there was an immediate saving of 130 grand to the Arboretum uh, lab people and 20 plus grand annually. That they, so that was from four meetings that were run differently produced this financial outcome. It's, it's that, I just find this intriguing that we preoccupy ourselves with, oh, it's all about this complex technical innovation journey that we've got to go through. And a lot of this is process, like on the ground process and group intelligence. So it removes risk and it fosters stability. And a lot of risk is social risk, the risk of feeling like you're going out on a limb in front of others. Um, some of the risk, of course, is financial, technical, operational. That gets resolved through piloting. So this is one of my favorite stories, and I'm just about to end now. Um, <coughs> Times Square, uh, Jeff Reason and mean, his uh, girl uh, studio, very, very famous studio, actually, out of Denmark. And they got the gig to upgrade Times Square. And he told this story at a TED talk that I saw, uh, um, a TEDx event. And he told the story of how in the world did this Danish studio come all the way over and change so radically America's most highly contested piece of real estate uh, in the country. And what they did was they used an adaptive operating system and a command control operating system. And they use the adaptive operating system first to really sense into this environment and understand it, which apparently no one had ever really done. And what they discovered was 89% of the users were pedestrians and 11% were vehicles. However, 89-90% was dedicated to vehicles and 10% was dedicated to pedestrians. Once they had that, that piece of very critical information, they deployed a highly, uh, a highly um, effective adaptive operating system where they piloted it, they piloted some changes on a small scale, they surveyed users, they took the, the, the data from the people on the streets and took that to the right political folks. They really circled around to reduce political risk for all the, the political decision makers from all the regulatory agencies. 
And over time, they got the command and control operating systems of several agencies to come in on this decision. And, and over a relatively short period of time, they were able to undertake this incredible amount of change. So you can see how the organizational model that you use can produce very powerful physical infrastructure outcomes. They then did it again uh, because it was so successful. They started to do it more and they've since done it in 50 different locations around New York. This whole process of adaptive operating system, sensing, get the people engaged, bottom up leadership of how space should be utilized. Previously it was all command and control. Agencies, regulatory authorities were top down on how space should be used. So the future for us is looking so extraordinary when we, you know, as we learn how to organize differently, as we learn how to unleash this kind of power by integrating both of these operating systems, which really comes down to understanding both of them, learning uh, by doing with both of them, and as my colleagues at um, Penn, uh, Penn State University, the translating that has to go on between these two operating systems is very, very important. Uh, Penn State recently adopted an extensive strategic plan that had requirements for sustainability embedded right down to every unit. And the sustainability office thought, ah, oh, this is it, our job's practically done. Every different unit, like 50, 60 of them now, is accountable for these sustainability goals. And so they went to meet with each unit to say, okay, how are you going to meet your goals? And they walked into rooms like this and said, okay, here are the goals, isn't this awesome? And what they got was about what I'm getting from you now, which is, I'm really tired and you've talked too much already. Uh, what they realized was, time and time again, they were not translating from the command control operating system talks in terms of goals. The adaptive operating system talks in terms of intrinsic purpose. So then they reshaped their question from, okay, here are the goals, we'll just put those aside, but what do you guys like doing? What are you good at? What would feel great for you to do? And then how can we then translate that into fulfilling these goals? No, and they got this radically different energy in the room and they started to realize that this translating role that has to happen is extraordinarily important in an organization. And last example, uh, MGM Resorts, uh, Cindy Ortega, she um, rattled this story off to me very, very quickly when I first met her and I was like, wow, that was so agile of your organization. How did that possibly happen? turned out, dual operating system. So, huge, huge organization, over 60,000 employees, they launched this online platform, My Green Advantage, which is a platform, it's like a gaming slash Facebook platform, where the participants log green behaviors and there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer interaction and encouragement. They managed to, uh, implement this in a very, very short time frame indeed and get um, over 600,000 behaviors logged on this platform by uh, tens of thousands of employees. Um, I, in looking at how they did it, Cindy, formerly a chief financial officer, um, is in the C-suite of this organization and she actually received initially a board directive to do something innovative and different that we would never otherwise do. And her team went away and actually came up with, their first stab at it was a 30% energy reduction across the whole organization within a short time frame. And they did very complex analysis on this, took it back to the board, and the board was like, wow, that's so good, we should be doing that anyway. So do that, and then come back with something that's really innovative and that you can't do without us. So that's when they went back to it and they found My Green Advantage. Now, she could have command controlled it straight through the organization of saying, we've got this platform, we're just going to do it. But she has intuitively learned over the years in her organization as in most organizations. It was very important she decided to check with them for tentative support, but immediately pilot it 
with some really receptive people. So she went back into the adaptive operating system. Let's pilot it, get some engagement. Then she said, well, I want to I get more support. So she did an executive roadshow, and she took this pilot experience around to everybody to get um, informal buy-in, again, adaptive operating system. Then with that roadshow, she, she tuned in, and there was a little bit of discontent here or there, so she did more piloting back adaptive operating system. Once this next round of piloting was over, she felt that, you know what, I've got all this informal buy-in. The adaptive operating system has cut out all the risk for me. There's no uncertainty. Political, technical, financial. I know the whole game. Then she went back to command control and said, let's do it. And they scaled it right out across the organization. So this is what we've been teaching in our program at Harvard in that we would normally have charged you $3,900 for, <laughs> for the terrific price by Jim of what? Something. It's free. Free! Oh my god. Fantastic. One of the really exciting things we're working on through this program is the idea of improving idea flow. So at the heart of it, we are sitting on this enormous latent human potential that's just in our organization that's untapped for sensing and creating, collaborating, enormous potential. And we really need to figure out what are we going to do on Monday about this. And this framing of understanding how an idea comes to be and what, what does it go through in its life cycle from idea creation to really identifying support reducing the risk to really scaling out. And what operating system is activated at what stage in the journey of an idea in your organization? And starting to understand that, you really get a sense of this is a dance. These operating systems are in this gorgeous dance in your organization to foster that engagement, get rid of that risk, and really transition and translate over to command control when we're ready. And we think that by really fostering this language, understanding more about the different kind of work these operating systems can do for us, we can radically scale up the volume of creativity, innovation, idea flow right across our organizations. And in the journey of business for good, I really think this is about the most exciting thing I've come across uh, lately in terms of really tapping our capacity to move forward. So, I think we've just got a minute. Maybe two questions. 